All right. Uh, hey, everybody. Welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for... Man, the camera's way too high. There we go. Welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Friday, January 30th, 2015. So, uh, joining me this week for a big roundup of space stories, we've got uh, David Dickinson. Hey, David. Hey, staying warm. <laughs> staying warm. Good. Uh, we've got Ramin uh, Skiba. Hey, Ramin. Hey, Fraser. Oh, staying dry. Staying dry. <laughs> yeah, San Diego. Yeah, it's super rough down there, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, and we've got a special guest this week, and he's muted, and so he, he has to unmute himself before we'll be able to hear his uh, him talk, which is, uh, we got uh, Paul Hildebrand. Hey, Paul. Hello. So uh, the special guest uh, is uh, the creator of a really cool documentary called The Fight for Space, which is in a uh, Kickstarter right now and wraps up in about, what, two days? Uh, yeah, Sunday morning. Sunday morning. And so uh, we thought we would, uh, you know, we've been really enthusiastic about it on, on Universe Today, and, uh, and so I thought I would uh, we'd get you here on the Weekly Space Hangout and, and sort of let you get a chance to explain what you're doing with the Fight for Space, and, uh, and maybe people can, uh, can join the Kickstarter and help you guys uh, push this over the, over the zone. So, uh, so we'll take a few minutes and talk to talk to Paul about the fight for space, and then we'll move on to the to the regular show. Now, as always, uh, you can you can join the conversation with, while you're watching the live video. Just go ahead and uh, and click on the the video itself, and you can come into the Q and A app, and you can ask any questions you want. And especially, you can ask any questions for Paul, uh, and we can pass those questions along to him, and uh, and you can sort of find out you can interact directly with Paul through me as your avatar. All right, so so Paul, can you give us a bit of background about about the project that you're working on for people who haven't seen the super cool trailer yet? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> can you hear me okay? Yeah, we hear you just fine. Okay. Um, yeah, so Fight for Space. Just a quick description is a documentary film that explores both the benefits of space exploration and uh, sort of the reasons why we have not been exploring space in a big way since the Apollo program. To go to so, <laughs> I was going to try and queue up the video, but we'll see oh. if, I can, if I can get this happening. Uh, so, that, I mean, that's the basic, you know, short, short version of the story, pretty much, is one, define the benefits of space exploration, because there's a lot of people out there that say, well, why are we spending money on space when we could be spending money on, you know, whatever down here on Earth? Um, so, issue one, and the issue two is, why aren't we, you know, what are the things that have been limiting us from going into space in, in, in a big way? And so, what was your process then in actually pulling this together? I know you've got, you've interviewed a bunch of our friends, uh, mm -hmm. a bunch of people who show up on this show on a regular basis, so, so but as well as scientists, astronauts, politicians, everyone, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, first it was a lot of uh, just asking a lot of general questions. You know, why don't we have a more ambitious space program? You know, why why did certain programs end and things like this? And then we started really going, digging deeper into the root core and causes of a lot of these issues. And we start getting into into budgets and and different uh, uh, how the government sort of controls and manages NASA and and decides on certain things. Um, so it really, you know, we spent about two and a half years interviewing um, and, and each interview would open up more questions. Um, so we'd have to, you know, go to the next person and, and sort of fill in the blanks. So it was, it was definitely a learning process for me and I probably know a lot more about space policy than I should. Uh, but, it, it, you know, it's, uh, it was a very interesting process. And so, but I mean, it hasn't come out as a documentary yet. You've you've now you're doing the Kickstarter. You're looking to raise money to help what turn this into its sort of final form. That's correct. Yeah. So originally, uh, you know, it was we we had raised money to produce the film, and it, just because it became so complicated, we had to do another Kickstarter, and and now we we're really pushing to get it out there uh, in just a few months. And uh, and get it out into limited theatrical release, and and then the plan is to have it on on public television later this year as well. And cool. Of course, and VOD and all that. 
Right, okay. And, uh, and so what is the place where people can go to actually get involved in, in the Kickstarter? They can go to fightforspace.com, and there's a link to the Kickstarter on there, or uh, Universe Today has a great article, um, or, you know, Kickstarter, and just search for Fight, uh, fight for Space. Awesome. And I know, uh, and so where do you stand on your Kickstarter right now, and how much are you looking to raise? Uh, we are, we surpassed our goal this morning at about 7, 7.30 a.m., uh, my time, so we're at, and we were looking to raise 80000 we're at 88000 right now. So that is so great. We're, 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 we're doing good. Oh, that's fantastic, man. I'm so pleased. Congratulations. Uh, yeah, that's fantastic. So, so go ahead. If you're using the Q&A app and you want to ask some questions uh, to Paul, do that. And I know you've got a ton of things to do. And I know you don't have a lot of time, so I just wanted to bring you in for a second. You can say hi. Uh, why don't we do this? Why don't we sort of, because I know you're super busy with, with trying to get this wrapped up, but why don't you come back maybe in a, in a couple of weeks, a month or so, when the dust has settled down, let us know how things are going, and give us a bit of a sort of preview as you're moving towards your wider theatrical release. Yeah, absolutely. I'd, I'd love to. If you have any questions, uh, any more questions now, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm available. So. Yeah. Um, we'll take it. There's a bit of a delay while people, uh, people sort of poke in. Who, who was the sort of most, uh, what was the biggest get? Who was one of the people who you were quite amazed wanted to sit down and, and talk with you and, uh, and was fairly candid? Um. Well, I mean, we, we had to seek out uh, pretty much everybody and, and convince them to be in the film. Uh, but some of the people that surprised me, um, uh, I would say uh, Rick Tomlinson. And, and Rick is one of the co-founders of the, of the Space, um, Space Frontier Foundation. Yeah, of course. Um, and when I went into the interview with him, I didn't really know who he was. I knew that he was involved in, the, in you know, commercial space, and he was this guy that was really enthusiastic. But I had no idea for what the what was going to come from the interview, and it really it really shaped the documentary in 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 a, in a way that I had not expected. And of course, Rick Tumblinson is looking to uh, mine asteroids now. So. Right, with his company, uh, Deep Space Industries. Yeah. Uh, which is now an industry, There's, and they've got competition right, with planetary resources, which is just which is just amazing. Um, uh, let's see. Um, I don't know if you guys have any questions. Have you guys seen the Have you seen the trailer, David? No, I haven't seen it yet. I have to go take a look at that. I'd heard of it, but I hadn't seen it, taken a look at it yet. Now, now, Paul, when people give you. Uh, that classic this is like this is literally the classic thing people tell us why should we bother exploring space why should we bother trying to go to other planets when there's so many problems here on earth why don't we get those problems fixed first before we push out into space so you mm -hmm. must get that a lot too what's your what's your answer to that yeah i mean uh the, you know the guys in the film explain it much better than i do but uh my my answer to when people say that is is that you can't just not try. You you can't just sit around and and wait for the uh, you know and wait for the end to come. You have to you have to explore. And the economic benefits and cultural benefits that came from, for example, going to the moon, have affected the world in you know, a huge way. You can't ignore it. And you can't you can't sit there with your cell phone and your GPS and go, well, we don't need the space program. You know, you can't you can't complain about that. Um, and we don't know what's going to come from from going further and deeper out into space. We don't know. Um, we could discover life, we could discover new resources, you know, countless new businesses could be formed, the economic benefits and and benefits to society are uh, greater than I think anybody can imagine and and that for me is why is why we explore space that's terrific uh, okay cool well let's uh, let's wrap this up let's let you go uh, I'm giving people a chance to ask any questions but uh, oh here we go uh, Ronald Minch wants to know will it be on TV or uh, or just in the theaters and have you got some CGI going into it <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, we will be doing a limited theatrical release. Obviously, that's very expensive. Um, so we'll be doing a very limited theatrical release in some some bigger cities and anywhere that we can we can get uh, interest. 
Um, and then and then the plan is that it will be on public television. That's that's the key word, public television, um, later this year. So um, certain PBS stations will hopefully air it. We've we've received interest from from uh, from those stations. So the plan is, and it has been for about uh, three years now, is to is to have it on television. Um, as far as CGI, um, we do have some CGI. It's not a huge part of the film. I'm mostly relying on uh, archival footage. Um, I didn't want to produce uh, a CGI-heavy film, but we do have um, Mr. Kuramura, uh, Koji Kuramura, who worked on Star Trek, and he's providing uh, us with some CGI, so we should have some good stuff in there. Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, David, try Netflix. Just talk to them. Yeah, the the right? eventual plan will be to get it on, on, on Netflix and iTunes and Amazon and all that stuff. Yeah. Um... Yeah, and Guido Bibra, uh, one of our German fans, wants to know what you know. Any chance of being able to see it over in Germany? I'm of course in Canada. Will I be able to see it in here in Canada? Yeah, uh, the discs that um, you know, I don't see why we do a region specific disc release. Um, and and of course it'll be available digitally online um, through uh, some sort of you know distribution platform. So it'll be available everywhere. And if there's a if there's a certain if there's enough interest in a in a town somewhere uh, in Canada or Germany, then we could definitely show it over there. Well, we could probably get organize some friends to do it in Vancouver. So uh, let me know. We'll see if we can do do something some kind of launch party in Vancouver. Sure. Yeah, that'd be fun. Uh, okay, well now I'm going to let you go, and we're going to move on to the actual to the actual news. So you can stick around and and join us for the conversation about the news for the next 40 minutes or so. But I, like I said, I know you're going to get a Kickstarter rating in two days, so I'm I'm impressed that you even were able to take the time to uh, uh, to to join us. So. Oh yeah, thank you for having me, and yeah, I'll probably I'll probably bug out, but thank yep. thank you very much. No problem, and, man. Uh, yeah, yeah, and keep us posted. Uh, we'll talk to you guys again. All right, see you. Paul. All right, thank you. All right. Okay, so let's move on to the news. Uh, so I'm going to go with David first, uh, and I didn't even tell people okay. what we'll be talking about this week. Uh, so let's talk about um, man. Okay, let's talk about the uh, the asteroid that came back, came by the Earth. We we've been talking about this for a couple of weeks. Uh, we're talking about how it's like the closest large asteroid to pass the Earth in for like the next 15 years. We're not going to see this asteroid again for yeah. decades. But it brought a bit of a surprise. Yeah, this is kind of interesting. This one passed uh, this past Monday night, passed three lunar distances from the Earth. Um, pretty good size, I believe it was like in the 600 meter class or so. Uh, and Arecibo and a bunch of uh, sites on Earth bounced radar off it, and it gave us a surprise. It was something we'd seen before, but it was always kind of interesting to know that it actually has a small moon. There's a uh, pretty cool animation that NASA put out showing that this asteroid has uh, probably in the, the range of about 10 meters or so of a small moon orbiting it. And I thought it was interesting reading about it that apparently this isn't uncommon. About 80% of the asteroids that we've looked at up close have turned out. This seems to be more common than not that asteroids are either binary or have moons orbiting them. I yeah, it's interesting. Oh, sorry, when they were telling us that, that there may, you know, there's a chance that the asteroid is going to have a moon, and then they found one. Uh, you know, it was really quite an impressive Nostradamus-like prediction. Yeah. But but now you're like, wait a minute, they all do. Well, that's, that's like saying, uh, looking at any given star in the sky. If I were to say that that particular star is a binary, I'd probably have a pretty good shot at being right yeah. because more stars are binaries or triples than not. There's Our probably planets actually, going around that star. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's that's a pretty good. That's like saying a celebrity will die this year. That's a pretty good prediction. You know, right. uh, you're, you're, you've got a, a pretty 80-90% chance of being right. So it's, uh, uh, remember QE2 a few years ago, that had a moon as well when that went by. Uh, I think it was 2012 QE2, or was, I can't remember the exact year, but that was just a few years ago. And it's yeah, interesting the, the, the one that was like the size of the Queen Elizabeth. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's interesting to note as we get closer to Dawn arriving at Ceres, I think there's a pretty good chance that Ceres probably has some small moons that have evaded detection. I was I was actually surprised they didn't find any at Vesta. I kind of thought they might. Uh, and as uh, 
as uh, New Horizons gets near Pluto, the odds are pretty good. We'll probably find more moons there too. Yeah, yeah, and I know we talked to uh, the New Horizons team, and that's definitely with with that flyby. That's one of the things they're going to be really careful about. They're going to have to observe yeah. the system around Pluto and discover moons, and then potentially have to change the trajectory of the spacecraft to steer well clear of these things as they're discovering them. And probably uh, Dawn uh, Dawn will have to do the same as well. I, I'm kind of surprised. I mean the the clarity of the images that we're starting to get from from series from Dawn are getting pretty good. So uh, yeah, you know. and everybody's speculating what the white dot is. I think it'd be even weirder if this uh, Dawn got there and the white dot was gone. <laughs> then we yeah, definitely this, have some explaining to do. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, folks, there's a lot of nut jobs out there which have been making some predictions. Um, yeah. But some of the most compelling arguments that I've heard is that it's light glinting off of a fairly large crater that's got snow in it, right? It may have ice or snow, or yeah, that's that's the most likely explanation. Yeah, and that you're seeing this sort of this persistent reflection from this region. But yeah. but even even those, I mean. I, Again, I, I don't want to show the animation because I don't want to get my video blocked on YouTube. <laughs> it's, <'cause> so cool. <laughs> it's so cool. It's so cool. Yeah, but the but you can see the other craters on the surface of Ceres as well. So if you haven't yeah, already... Actually, yeah, you're actually getting a pretty good resolution on what they're seeing, and we're going to keep seeing that get better and better as the months go on, too. So Ceres is becoming a real world to us, just like this that is. Yeah, not a dot anymore. Care for this for for New Horizons. So, all right, well, let's move on. Uh, oh man, we are going to totally ruin Inflation Christmas now. Um, so, Sorry, guys. Yeah, yeah, and I, you know, I feel really bad that uh, you know Brian Coberline or Dac Dr. Matthew Francis aren't here to to share in this with us, especially Brian Coberline because he's been doing so much great reporting about. Uh, about the the Planck uh, or about the bicep two uh, discovery of pr primordial gravitational waves, and so now the Planck data is in, and the jury says, "Well, the jury says it looks like it's not statistically significant." The, the signal that bicep two uh, found, and uh, so I, I basically first heard about it on Twitter. Um, and in fact, speaking of Matthew Francis, I guess he's writing something about it, and so we'll see what what uh, he has to say. Basically, what happened was there was some summary of this joint analysis by Bicep2 and Planck uh, scientists, uh, so, so a paper that's going to be posted on the archive preprint server next week, and I think it's submitted to the Astrophysical Journal, and um, the summary was on uh, some French website and in French. Um, I, I saw the website, but I don't speak French, so I couldn't really figure things out. Um, but uh, based on this, and, and now now the site's down, or the, this uh, this posting, so you can't find that, but um, th uh, there are a couple of articles coming out based on what has been leaked so far, and so yeah, ESA yeah. did a press release just today, yeah. so it's getting pretty official now. Yeah, so it sounds like it's it's you know uh, the the real deal, and so uh, but yeah, so it seems like there may be a signal, but it it could be noise, it could be dust, um, or it could be um, you know just a weak signal of of the primordial gravitational waves. So all they can really say is that they're sort of an upper limit, so a statistical limit, in which case you need an even more precise measurement or a really even more precise analysis in order to say whether it is a signal or not. So for now, basically, uh, the jury's still out. Um, the, the universe has, uh, you know, innocent until proven guilty of gravitational waves. And yeah. So we'll see how it goes. That's unfortunate because the, I mean, the discovery of the primordial, the, the primordial gravitational waves really gave a lot of uh, evidence to the this idea of inflation in the early in the early universe. Exactly. And, and, and we should probably say that it's it's actually an extremely difficult measurement to make. I mean until recently nobody had even attempted it because it wasn't even possible. Uh, so what they're doing is they're measuring the polarization of the cosmic microwave background radiation. And so looking at the uh, the distribution of structure that's that's one thing. But to look at the, the, the polarization of the waves, it's, it's, it's an extremely weak signal to try to detect. And so it's, it's, um, it's something that people have been wanting to do for a long time, and now they're working on more in more detail. And so I guess we have to just wait longer and see, see, uh, yeah. uh, see what happens. But this you is know, how this works, right? I mean, yeah. 
You, you know, Advanced LIGO is going online um, next year. I, I wonder if that's going to join this, uh, this whole battle with biceps for the detection of gravitational waves, primordial gravitational waves, anyway. Yeah, maybe. I, I don't know. I mean, I think there, I, I mean, I've only heard about the, the, the normal gravitational waves that they'll be studying, but yeah, so I don't know if that, it's... it's okay. Yeah, I don't know I, if LIGO is going to have the ability to detect the, I, the I know, ones. I know from some of my research a few years ago, I've been to both LIGO detectors, and I know that they've placed constraints on on some uh, parameters for gravi primordial gravitational waves just by the non-detection that they've done. Okay. Which isn't as sexy, I know, as detecting... Nobody likes to write a, an article saying, LIGO didn't detect gravity waves again, but there is some science to be done in just the fact that they haven't detected anything yet. Yeah, Absolutely. it's a process of elimination, right? Yeah. yeah. And in it's fact, some, some, people, some people complain that there aren't enough papers written about non-detections. You know, people just yeah. say, oh, it's not worth writing about. But then the problem is that when, when those papers aren't written, then scientists go and look at the same problem and remake the wheel later, and then they realize, oh, we didn't detect this again. Yeah. And so it's, oh, well, it's I'm not going to write better. about it. I know going. from a, from a news perspective, nobody likes to write about, we didn't find something yet again, but it's still, like you said, from, from a science perspective, it is important. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, I man, what a what a letdown. I'm sure the the folks at Planck are pretty sad about it too. So, yeah. Uh, well, let's get set uh, for the upcoming uh, all Deberon <laughs> occultation. Actually, actually, the 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 first occultation of the year happened. Uh, I wrote the article, and the occultation came and went a few days ago. But it's interesting to still note that this is the first in a series of thirteen occultations of the bright star Aldebaran by the moon. Now this one didn't get observed by, most of us saw the moon go through the Hyades open cluster, go very near Aldebaran, and then it was a very close conjunction. The only place they would have saw an occultation this week would have been from the high Arctic. Uh, so probably a few polar bears and maybe some distant early warning stations in northern Canada might have seen it. But it's interesting to note because the moon is going to now pass in a pulse uh, Aldebaran for 13 times this year, and it's going to keep doing it all the way up through 2018. And it's interesting yes. to note, too, because okay. yesterday I was actually able to see uh, Aldebaran in the daytime with binoculars near the moon. So it's, it's right around first magnitude, so it is possible to see something that faint uh, near the moon. You've got the daytime moon up there, so you can see that with the naked eye, and I just aimed up binoculars right off to the side where I knew it was, and I could actually see it. So that's kind of a nifty little thing. There's a, there's a lot more daytime astronomy to be done than most people realize. So, I mean, one of the things with this is that, you know, because of the geometry involved, where you live on the Earth depends on whether yeah. you, the Moon, and Aldebaran are going to line up so that you're going to be able to see an occultation. And this is the yeah. situation, right? People in the high Arctic got to see it, but anyone in more southern latitudes didn't get a chance to, to see it. Yeah. So, so will most people on Earth get a chance to observe they're, one they're or gonna, more every, of these occultations? Everybody's going to get at least one somewhere uh, during the next couple of years. And like I said, even in the daytime, it is possible to see an occultation of Aldebaran during the daytime. Uh, if you can see the moon, you can see it with binoculars on the limb. I've seen one before when I was in Alaska back in the late 90s, and you can actually see it. There's four bright stars that are uh, brighter than second magnitude that the moon can cross. Aldebaran's one, there's Spica, there's Antares, and Regulus as well. We had a season of uh, Spica occultations last year, so now we're entering into Aldebaran season. Until about 2,000 years ago, the moon could actually occult the star Pollux as well. It can't anymore. Precession has kind of drawn it away from that region of the sky. Uh, yeah, I had a bunch of people making all kinds of Star Wars jokes at me. <laughs> Alderaan. Alderaan, yeah, it sounds like Alderaan. Sounds a lot like it, but it's close. Yeah, you yeah. could also make a Star Trek reference. Uh, they one time drink uh, whiskey from some pl uh, from from Aldebaran. Oh, I never knew that one. That's yeah, one. yeah, they refer to Aldebaran whiskey that Captain Picard <laughs> got. <laughs> I didn't um, know that one. I could put that in your article. <laughs> all right, so we've got uh, we've got an interesting uh, situation in citizen science now, where some some citizen science astronomers turned up some weird objects, and they forced. The, uh, the astronomers to dig into it and come up with an answer for them. Exactly. So uh, this is uh, part of the Milky Way project, 
which is uh, one of the uh, citizen science projects from the, what's called the Zooniverse. Uh, with, and the, the Zooniverse actually started with uh, Galaxy Zoo, uh, which I've been involved in myself. And uh, sometimes uh, by having citizen scientists, so you know, people who volunteer and par uh, participate looking at images and classifying things, identifying things, um, you can find, thing, find objects uh, or, or signals that you just wouldn't see otherwise just because when you have that many eyes looking at that many images, it's, it's, uh, it, it get, it's, it's more powerful than, than just, say, um, just looking at a handful of images on your own. And so, for example, with Galaxy Zoo, people found what they called things that look like green peas which turned out to be really compact uh, galaxies. And so now, with the, in the Milky Way project, um, these uh, citizen science volunteers found uh, what they called, uh, uh, what they call them, yellow balls. And, uh, and, what, and they're within, so within the Milky Way, there's a bunch of these, um, you know, yellow circles that uh, really hadn't been seen before, um, at least in these images. And so uh, there's a paper written by, um, um, Grace Wolf Chase and uh, Charles Curtin and others, uh, and so so they actually you know the astronomers have done research based on these and and they appear to be um, really massive star formation. So they're using um, the Spitzer Space Telescope, which um, uh, uh, gets imaging in the uh, infrared wavelengths. And so in the infrared, what you can see is basically light that's come off of off of the stars, heats up uh, and is absorbed by the dust. And then is re the the light is then re-emitted in the infrared, and so uh, so it's basically reprocessed light. But then that means you can see not just the star itself, but also the dust around it. And so that's so I think that's where the the you know the yellow balls come from. It's you're not not looking at just the star, but the stuff around it. And so when you have just a really massive uh, star formation, you can basically light up all the dust, and uh, and and it can be detected here. And so this seems to be a promising uh, uh, way to look at these uh, at star formation in our own galaxy. And so um, I think uh, 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 people in the, working with the Milky Way project are continuing to study this and see what they can learn about um, about you know star formation in our own galaxy. Well, it's a nice collaboration where where these people, all these these citizen scientists, volunteers who've been looking through all this data, notice something, an object, and they don't know what it is, and they post into the forums I've, and, like, hey, anybody know what this is? And we have, like, what, Hanny's Verwerp? Was it? Vorwerp? Vorwerp? Yeah. Yeah, and exactly. The, and that was the a... green peas, and... Yeah, yeah the Vorwerp was named after a Dutch school teacher, um, and, and she herself has been to some astronomy meetings um, uh, since then, and uh, yeah, she just happened, happened to, to find this uh, uh, interesting object. And so, so yeah, so there's there's both. It's both useful for uh, uh, finding rare objects that astronomers hadn't seen before. Also, it's useful for statistics, just because you know when you have that many eyes looking at that many images, it's just ne um, making possible what was not possible by a smaller number of astronomers before. So there's thousands and thousands of people who are volunteering, and um, you know if any of the viewers here want to participate, uh, I encourage you to do so. It's it's it seems like a really fun project. Yeah, I, I love the, those kinds of stories where you get this situation where, uh, you know, and you, amateurs are discovering new species, they're finding new kinds of birds, insects, lizards, things like that, things that that then the uh, the scientists can can do further research into. And it's a, I think that's a great collaboration, and and it, I hope that the scientists, I'm sure, yeah, I know the folks at the Galaxy Zoo Project are pretty enthusiastic. I mean, they built the whole system, but but other scientists can really uh, respect the contributions that the general public can provide. And um, one, one more quick uh, uh, comment on this is that uh, in, I guess it's not next week, but the week after, there will be a meeting of the Citizen Science Association, and then the and then there will be citizen science sessions at the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Um, and so both those meetings will be in San Jose, California, and I'll be there so I can tell you if there are new updates or new things that come up. Uh, yeah, and, uh, and fair disclosure, I am one of the directors of Astrosphere, which is uh, the umbrella organization for CosmoQuest, among other things. And, uh, you know, we've got the, the moon mappers and Vesta mappers and Mars mappers and ways that you can help us categorize craters on the moon, craters on Mars, things like that. So same, same thing again. There's all kinds of crazy, interesting legitimate mysteries on Mars and on the Moon that need further analysis. And it's only by having a lot of eyeballs on the 
on the job, can you get to a place where you can start to turn up some of these things where people can go, huh, I wonder what that is. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, okay, cool. So let's, um, David, let's talk about uh, the albedo of, uh, of 67P compared yeah. to other things. And I'll get, I'll get a picture up while we're, while we're talking. So. Oh, okay, yeah. that would be cool, actually. Yeah, it's uh, kind of interesting. We don't usually appreciate how, how dark bodies like, like the moon or especially Comet 67P actually are. And I saw this interesting comparison. It went around a few months ago. But it's the first time I had seen it this week, so I dug in and I was like, you know what? We actually, uh, Bob King wrote about the albedo of uh, 67P, but I don't think we'd actually shown this image before. And it's interesting when you compare it for true contrast, looking at uh, the objects in the image, the, the, the white cue ball looking image is uh, Enceladus, Saturn's moon. And of course, you've got the Earth and the moon in there. And this is for true light comparison. You're talking albedo, you're talking how reflective these bodies are. And 67P, uh, me and Nancy were joking, it's one thing I put in the article, I like to use this Final Tap reference to say that this is so black, I mean, there is none more black, actually, than what you're seeing right here. It's, uh, it's, it's really amazing, it's the, the albedo, I'd say, was down about 5%, I believe, when I was reading through the article, which is lower than the moon. The moon is about 10, 8 to, 8 to 12% for albedo, which is actually pretty dark. Most of the astronauts said that uh, the moon dust, when they were up close, like what got on their spacesuits when they got back in the capsule, it looked more uh, like, like they had been playing in a cold bin or something like that, which we don't really appreciate when we see the moon. But you see all that light con uh, that's uh, compacted down into an area like the size of your thumbnail held at arm's length. It looks very white, but the moon is actually a very dark place. And it's looking like... If, if uh, 67P is any indication, uh, a lot of comets actually are pretty dark, which is amazing because these are the same bodies that can get bright enough that you can see them in the daytime when they're uh, at perihelion. Speaking of which, 67P is reaching perihelion in a few months, too. And uh, that's going to be uh, an interesting time as well uh, to keep, as Rosetta keeps observing the comet as it gets closer. But when they use that term, right, dirty snowballs, yeah. that, that really is, I mean, it's not even that. It's just... Dirt. Yeah, it's it's or icy uh, dust ball. A, yeah, ash you know asphalt or. Um, yeah, and, it, and and if you're like like me up here in uh, New England digging out from the latest snowstorm, which we've got another one tonight, we have actually very high albedo out here now. When you've got that freshly fallen snow, we're we're more like the surface of Enceladus than we are the surface of 670. Only of course we would have uh, CO2 and methane laced uh, ice snow on Enceladus, but you know it's. Uh, and, you know, it's interesting that that albedo on the Earth can actually play a role. Like when you're looking at the Earth shine on the moon shining back at us, which is the reflection of sunlight on the gibbous Earth coming back, that can vary, too, based on how much cloud and snow cover is turned toward the moon. I've seen it where you almost couldn't see uh, the Earth shine on, on the limb of the crescent moon. But a few weeks ago, a lot of us were remarking that it was very prominent. I mean, you could see the dark uh, maria in the mountain ranges with the naked eye, and it was... Uh, it definitely was more pronounced, and that can be a function of how uh, reflective the Earth is, and that plays a role into what's called uh, global dimming as well. Uh, albedo is tied into that, uh, a lesser known uh, controller of the climate along with global warming and things like that. It really demonstrates how impressive it is that these astronomers are finding these comets as early as they do, because yeah. as you can see, they, they barely... Uh, reflect any light. But then the other thing is also, it also demonstrates how difficult it is for astronomers to get a good sense of how big these objects are. Because, yeah. I, you know, I mean, you would expect the comet to look like Enceladus with that level of exactly. snow and brightness and not uh, how it really does look up close, this dark black charcoal. It looks like charcoal, right? Yeah. It looks like a chunk of lava on, on Hawaii. And I, so, I can't help but think when I see the, the, the duck-shaped structure 67P that probably eventually, because it's on a short period orbit and it's getting more material ablated as it gets closer to the sun, th those two lobes will probably separate eventually. You know, it, it's, it's probably going to be wore down to the point that uh, we were just talking before the show that uh, Comet uh, 17P Holmes is out undergoing another outburst right now. So it, uh, 67P will probably uh, break apart. Well, there's actually a big crack along the neck of yeah. the comet. It'd be cool if it did it while we were watching. That would yeah. be very cool. <laughs> yeah, when we could get a, uh, you know, we could get our own Shoemaker Levy uh, two. I, 
I, I'd love to get a look at 17 p homes and see if there's any comet out there that I could just like magically go out and get a, get a look at because obviously something interesting is going on there because we had a major outburst back in 2007 and it, it seems very that particular comet seems very prone to outbursts so there's something structurally interesting there I think. Oh, really cool. Um, and then I think you had one more story you wanted to talk about. Yeah, iPhone astrophotography. Which oh, real quick. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, there, there's been uh, Andrew Symes up in Canada uh, has been using his iPhone uh, hooked up to his help to his uh, Celestron 8 inch, and every time I, I retweet any of his photos, they automatically just it seems like my 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 tweet deck sounds like a slot machine all of a sudden. So it's like yeah. you know what? It's like I sat down and interviewed him just to see how are you doing. I mean, he's not only doing you know it's not hard to, to take your Android or iPhone, aim it up to your telescope eyepiece and get an image of the moon. But he's getting images of, he's got every planet, uh, Mercury through Saturn. He hasn't got Uranus and Neptune yet. He's got images of Comet Lovejoy, which I thought was pretty cool. And he's done some deep sky stuff too. He's already been getting M42 and M13, some of the brighter, messier objects. So I was like, how are you doing these photos? And he's actually doing something akin to what I do with webcams, where he's, he's actually imaging these, processing, stacking video. He does solar images through his hydrogen alpha scope. And I just thought it was kind of interesting to, to delve into uh, smartphone photography. After photography is apparently a thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there's two challenges, right? One challenge is just getting your phone bolted on to the yeah. eyepiece of the telescope. And <clears throat> there's a lot of really interesting mounts that have come out now that will actually do this little plastic yeah. gadgets. Some you can even there, 3D print yourself that you can take the, there, you know, the model of your phone, clamp it on to, the, to your telescope, and then the light from your telescope is coming into yeah. your phone. Uh, but the other problem is that you don't get a long exposure. Like when we're using our DSLRs to do the really long exposure pictures of the night sky, I can set my DSLR to capture photons for for 30 seconds or for a minute or for three minutes, right? Yeah. These, but the phones, they're not designed to do that. So how does he get around that problem? Uh, for the deep, the deep sky images, he, he's uh, doing, and a lot of astrophotographers are doing this now, instead of taking a three-minute exposure, you're taking a lot of small exposures and stacking them together. There's uh, freeware programs like Deep Sky Stacker out there that will do that now. And he actually uses the low-tech method I used before to cut down the glare, because most of the planets, uh, if you just aim your iPhone up to a telescope uh, at Jupiter, say, it will be an overexposed dot, and you only have so much control on your brightness on your phone. Uh, when you're aiming at what he does, and I've done this in the virtual star party with my webcam, uh, aiming at the moon to damp, damp it down, is he has a, a variable polarizer filter on the eyepiece. So you're just you're stopping it down before the light ever leaves the eyepiece to get into the phone. So you've got that variability control. And I like with the variable polarizers, I've got it real time. So if there's clouds, you know how many times we've done the virtual star party where there's clouds moving in front of the moon. So the moon will be really, really bright. They'll be really, really faint. And, and I can be like just manually twisting this little filter in real time and kind of keeping up with the cloud cover. So that, that's that's how he's doing it to stop down a lot of the, the brightness through his brighter targets. Yeah, no, just just terrific, guys. So so if you're wondering like what kind of gear you really need to be able to do this, I mean, uh, he's got a, Andrew's got a eight inch telescope, but I mean you can do this yep. with a six inch telescope. So and if you've already got a phone, uh, you're you know you're just looking for a mount. And you're pretty yeah. much ready to go. So for a couple hundred dollars, you can start doing some entry level astrophotography and just find out if this is if this is the a hobby that you want to do. And I think what's great about it is that you'll get with a six inch telescope and and some and some f photographs, you'll get a much better experience through your telescope than you ever can just staring through a way bigger telescope. Like even if you look just used your eye and looked through like a sixteen inch telescope. You're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna see a, a maybe a better image, but it's yeah. not gonna last very long. It's gonna just be in your eyeball, right? You're not gonna really see it. But if you take the photographs and you pr work with that medium, uh, it's a lot more satisfying, I think. And so, because everybody who gets into this hobby really wants to end up in the astrophotography place, because <laughs> that's how you get to sort of air it and remember it and and really tweak and get the most out of your imagery. So that's great. So if you haven't seen it, his his Twitter handle is failed 
protostar. Yeah. Uh, and that's Andrew Symes, and he is absolutely terrific, a total inspiration to all of us. And by all means, read uh, David's article on, on Universe Today. Uh, it should be just on the homepage still, I hope. Um, I think so. I think it is. Yeah. All right, well, let's move on. So this is the time where we talk about uh, the stories that have, that have been proposed by the WSH crew. This is, of course, the weekly Space Hangout crew. You can get uh, access to this community on Google+. Plus. There, There's not a lot of them, but they are. you will not find a more dedicated, enthusiastic crew of, uh, of space, uh, space fanatics. So you can just do a search on Google+, Plus for the WSH crew crew community, and there's a, you know 300 people there, um, and they're sharing all kinds of space stories, and we steal from them, and uh, we get inspired by the by the stories that they're posting, anything that slipped through the cracks that we missed. So um, let's just go at random here. Uh, so Ramin, do you want to talk about the uh, this black hole that astronomers saw gobbled up? Um, this story was proposed by Tom Nafee. As usual, uh, and this is uh, that a black hole chokes on a swallowed star. So, what what do people see? Yeah, so it's a um, <clears throat> there's an event that was captured by a telescope at McDonald Observatory, and uh, so there were some scientists who detected something which, you know, at, they, at first they thought it might be a, a supernova or something, um, and they called the event uh, Dougie. By the way, it was named after a character in in the South Park cartoon. Um, and so they, they also they also study it with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, um, and it turns out that it's it's basically so um, people a few times before have seen uh, stars getting swallowed up by a black hole, but in this case it seems to be more spectacular uh, than usual, I guess if, if if you can say we know what happens usually, uh, but it's uh, so it seems to be that it's it's such a a bright star and and, and a massive one that it's getting torn apart and giving off tons of radiation. And it's basically clogging up the black hole with, with so much material that it's taking a while for the black hole to eat it all up, I guess you could say. <laughs> and so, if, so if you want to use that metaphor, then that's, that's where that, that headline comes from, that is basically choking on, on the radiation. So it's going to take a while to basically uh, t tear, tear up the whole star and eat it up. And so it's, it's just um, a pretty cool thing that, that uh, people have detected. They've also tried doing simulations at UC Santa Cruz, and so it's, it's just a, a rare experience of a, of a star getting torn up. So it's pretty cool. That's awesome. Uh, sure. All right, cool. Uh, do you want to talk about the, uh, the super, super Saturn, uh, Dave? Yeah. So yeah, this, this one comes from of, Cecil Morgan. Yeah, this is kind of an interesting detection that came out of an exoplanet, an automated exoplanet detection system called SuperWasp. And what they were looking at, this, this is they're looking at the, an actual set of uh, transits in front of the star, kind of like Kepler does. And they, they saw uh, a telltale winking out where it's like, it's like bright and faint and bright and faint. And they know from this complex series of winking out, they're, they're deducing that this is actually a large gas giant that has a large ring system around it. But it's, uh, the, the star itself is a J1407. And this, these detections were done over a period of 57 days back in 2007. The star is 4,434 light years away. And they're saying that this is many, many times larger than Saturn. Let's see if that's a, the ring system stretches 100 million, 180 million kilometers to contain an Earth's worth of mass. So that's pretty stupendous. And incidentally, that's how they found the ring system around uh, Uranus too, back in uh, with the... Uh, it was one of the airborne observatories back before Sophia. I know it flew on a C-141 Starlifter. I can't think of the name. I think it was the Kuiper Observatory. They actually observed Uranus, and they saw this set of, uh, of uh, bright star occultations where it was a background star that was brightening and fading, fading out and brightening again. And they deduced that Uranus had a set of rings. But this, this one is pretty amazing when, it, when they list the, the actual uh, extent of the, the ring structure is... Uh, It'd be kind of amazing to see. It almost sounds like a debris disk to me more than a ring, but uh, it's uh, pretty pretty amazing. All right, well, let's move on. Uh, so this one comes from uh, also Tom Nathy, um, and this is the Hawaiians fight uh, the mega telescope construction on sacred ground. And this story comes from from NBC News, which makes me think it might be Alan Boyle. Uh, so Ramin, have you been <laughs> been following this one? No, this is uh, yeah. I don't know the. Uh, the the person who wrote the story. But yeah, it's, this is basically just an update of something that we talked about at a previous uh, weekly Space Hangout. 
um, which is that, so the 30 meter telescope, which uh, people are um, uh, building in Hawaii, it's one of the, the three big telescopes, of, the next generation of big telescopes that people are constructing. So the other ones are the Giant Magellan Telescope and the European Extremely Large Telescope, and both of those will be in Chile. Uh, but, so the 30 meter telescope, they're planning to uh, complete it in 2022, um, and it will, uh, it, it sounds like it'll be very impressive, and they'll have, uh, they say, 10 times the power of the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, so this is one of these really big telescopes that will be uh, ground-based. Um, the, the problem is that this is sacred ground on Hawaii, um, and uh, can you still hear me okay? My computer's going a little... Yeah, yeah, yeah we can hear you. Okay. So, uh, the, uh, so just what's happening is that there, there are people, um, native Hawaiians, who are uh, protesting just and, and trying to um, put together legal challenges to the telescope. Basically, there are agreements that uh, you can have only a certain number of telescopes um, on, uh, on the ground there, and, uh, and there's, there's an agreement that, that needs to be renewed between Native Hawaiians and the University of Hawaii. And so this is a, um, an ongoing debate, and so it's, you, you want to be respectful, um, and you also want as much science to come out. And so they're, they're basically you have to have some sort of a compromise. And uh, I get the impression that they're far from a compromise right now. So um, I don't know what's going to happen. Um, hopefully they'll be able to work something out. So I, I, I don't know what, what the situation yeah. is other than, other than that the, the challenge is continuing. We'll keep you posted. Yeah. Um, all right, we'll do one more here. And this was a really interesting story that I think just came out in the last couple of days, which is this idea that you can transform uh, mini Neptunes into super Earths. Yeah, this is an interesting study. This interesting study that came out, and this is looking at uh, ideas of planets that are orbiting red dwarf stars that are over time are, are drug in closer to their host stars, and that the idea is that since these stars have uh, these stars are very old, these stars live for a long period of time, and they're very miserly in, in their nuclear fusion production of energy. So they they can have lifespans in trillions of years. So you can think of if anything can happen anywhere, we're wondering, yeah, it's a good artist conception. It might be around a red dwarf star. Now, these stars are these Neptune-sized, I would say, ice giants. I usually consider Neptune and Uranus ice giants rather than true gas giants. Are drug in closer from uh, entirely locked over time that they might actually be uh, subliminating a lot of their atmosphere and a lot of their material off. And they may fall down from the ice giant category into the more uh, terrestrial planet type category over time. And it's interesting to think that around a red dwarf, like I said, since they last so long, even though they've got all, life has all those solar flares and things to put up with when you're that close in, the habitable zone for these stars are very close in as well. If they get tidally locked, there's an idea out there that maybe life has a lot more time to arise there than it did does. Uh, it had about four billion years here to arise on Earth. You've got in the order of tens of billions of years for life to arise there. Of course, the universe is only in the 13.7 billion year category right now. So whether life has arose around any of those planets orbiting red dwarfs, who knows? But you no, know, life doesn't necessarily have to survive somewhere like what you see here. So it's an interesting idea. Yeah, one of the problems with, with these red dwarf stars as well is in their earlier stages, they're quite energetic and they blast out yeah. a lot of radiation. And that's thought that, yeah. that it would be deadly to any life that's, that's, on that, that's, that's on any of those worlds. And so people are like, well, no, that's it. Red dwarf stars, no chance. Yeah. But what people are finding is all these interesting strategies for maybe how life could survive, and and this is this is one of the most unique ideas that I've heard in in a long time. Right, you, this idea think, that that these Neptune-sized worlds or or mini Neptunes migrate inwards into a much closer orbit, and then that that high levels of radiation and on the star actually just strips away the excess gas until you, and then at some point the star calms down and the and the Neptune has been turned into an Earth, and so it's almost like it's protected, and it's a way to bring that water and ice into the inner solar system. It's uh, it's pretty, it, it, pretty that, clever. That's, that's another problem too, is how water gets in beyond the snow line, and that that's one dilemma that that's uh, always wondered about how Earth got its water. Whereas you look at Mars and Venus and everything else in, that's in 
inside the snow line in our solar system is bone dry. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, really clever. Uh, okay, cool. Well, let's uh, let's wrap things up. I've got a couple of questions here, which we can do quickly. Uh, Stephen Hawkins asks, not to be, uh, not Stephen Hawking, Stephen Hawkins. Not, not Stephen Hawking. Uh, yeah. Has a, ha, has a decision been made for where New Horizons will go after Pluto? There, there is an object up in the Kuiper Belt. I've seen, uh, there is uh, one or two shortlist objects out there. I don't have it right in front of me, but they, yeah. they do have some Kuiper Belt targets. Yeah, they they uh, we talked to uh, Alan Stern. If you you can go back in the feed, my feed on Universe Today, uh, YouTube. But uh, but Alan Stern was talking about that. They they got some time on Hubble. They were able to find a couple of potential targets. They haven't. I don't think they they haven't decided which ones they're going to go to. But they do have some follow on targets after Pluto that they're going to go after one, as well. One so. of the big problems they had searching with Hubble and ground based telescopes is Pluto is currently in the direction. Of Sagittarius, which is right toward the galactic center, so it's very star rich. So to see anything uh, moving uh, across that background that's very, very faint has been very challenging to do. Um, let's see. Uh, Tom Nathy uh, has linked to a variable polarizer, so from Mead. <laughs> So if you want to get one, they're cool little toys. Yeah, and you can just twist the eyepiece there, and it, it twists the filter on the end of it. And it's, it's a, you can get them for cameras too. But it's a, it's a, it's the same concept as what you screw on the front of a DSLR kind of thing. The two lens polarizers. All right. So so Ronald Minch asks a question. Uh, can you see every star in the Milky Way if you are on the equator? Uh, the answer would be no. Right. <laughs> it's just. Uh, um, there, there are too many stars, uh, stars out there, and some of them are just going to be too faint anyway. Um, but I think um, uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe Dave Dickens can say say more. But my my guess is well, that well, you know, I mean, one mis misconception that people have is like they wonder: is the solar system aligned with the Milky Way? And of course, you, no. all you have to do is go and look at the night sky, and you can see that they're not. That you know where I'm living, the Milky Way kind of goes from the northwest and goes down to the southeast across my sky. While the plane of the ecliptic, the place where the sun, the moon, and all the planets, that comes from the from the sort of the east and goes across the sky through the south and goes to the west. So you can actually see with your eyes yeah. that the Milky Way and the plane of the ecliptic are in in two different places in the sky. That's sort of yeah, the first part. There was, I think it, I think it was Corey Schmidt uh, took a very good photo of the uh, zodiacal light and the Milky Way, and you could actually see because the zodiacal light follows the ecliptic, and you could see the crossing. He was taking it, I believe, from South Africa, and you could actually see the plane of the of the galaxy and the ecliptic are really at a very steep angle to each other. And then the other thing to think about is just this idea that you know that the that the the Milky Way, where the Milky Way is, what parts of the Milky Way we're seeing over the course of the year change. And so yeah. when you're in the summer, you're seeing the parts of the Milky Way that are away from the sun. And when you're in the wintertime, you're seeing the parts of the Milky Way that are away from the sun, and they're different parts. In the summer for us, um, we get to see Sagittarius rise in the southern sky, and so we're seeing into the center of the Milky Way. But in the wintertime, Sagittarius is down, we're seeing out into the outskirts of the Milky Way, and those, and those positions flip over the course of the year. So, that's, and then, of course, we can't see, and nobody can see, the stuff that's on the other side of the Milky Way because it's blocked just, by the gas and dust of the Milky Way. Exactly. It's too much stuff to see through since we're living yeah. in the middle of the disk there, ourselves. There, there could well be other small satellite companions of our galaxy we haven't seen. Just because they're on the other side. But we talked about uh, about infrared astronomy and how that helps us be able to uh, to see through that gas and dust. And the astronomers yeah. are actually getting more and more of the Milky Way mapped out by being able to use these these wavelengths to let them see through. So great question, Paul. Um, yeah. Right. Well, let's give people a chance to uh, find out more about the about our guests. David, uh, where do we find out more? Uh, see, this week I've been active on Canada.com, List Store, uh, my own site, Apps for Guys, where I'm offering up free science fiction every week of, of my own doing, and Universe Today, of course. And next week, I think my big push will be the opposition of Jupiter is coming up, so 
it is prime Jupiter observing season, so that's what I'm, I'm going to be all about next week. Jupiter is just so bright in the sky right now. Yeah, and it's, it's one of the cooler amazing. planets because things is that things are actually happening there with the moons and the belts and the great red spot. It's always it's always very cool to observe. And a lot of you sent in your pictures to me of your uh, of the triple transit, which I which sure, was there were some pretty good ones that came out. Yeah. yeah, I think I think a lot of us. I was hampered by weather here. We had a snowstorm, of course, so I didn't see it. I've seen two of them before, so I'll have to wait till twenty thirty six. I think oh, the no. I think that the fact that it was January in the northern hemisphere uh, was a big barrier for a lot of people to get out there and brave the cold to to try to image this. So there wasn't a, a lot of pictures, but there were some good ones. Awesome. All right, and Ramin, where do we find out more? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Ramin Skiba, and uh, I my blog is at uh, raminskiba.net. Um, I'm writing a, a post there now that will sort of summarize some of the main results that came out of the American Astronomical Society meeting. Uh, we've talked about a lot of them um, on these weekly space hangouts uh, anyway, but if you want to see a summary of, of my incomplete uh, 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 <laughs> an incomplete summary just because there's so much stuff going on. Yeah. Uh, you can go there. Um, also, I'll probably write uh, on Universe Today about the Planck and Bicep 2 result, but I might uh, uh, wait until the paper comes out myself so I can uh, screw No. Myself. No, just start right now. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll start now, but I want to see yeah. what they actually say. No. No, no. As your, as your editor, I suggest you, uh, you get that story up right away. <laughs> oh, <I like> that. <laughs> right. um, but uh, great, and so of course I'm uh, FKN on Twitter. I uh, you should definitely check out our um, uh, the Universe Today feed on YouTube as well as Universe Today website. Uh, lots of great stuff for you to interact with us. Um, also, uh, the Shorty Awards are, have come out, and so I just want to remind everybody that they can go to the Shorty Awards, they can search in the science category, and start uh, nominating some of the uh, some of the science people who who you're really a big fan of. Um, I, uh, I publicly endorsed uh, Emily Lakdawalla, of course, from the Planetary Society, and uh, because of her fantastic coverage of, uh, especially of the Rosetta mission. But if you're watching this right now and you want to make some recommendations, now's your chance to, to nominate some people for some Shorty Awards. And, uh, you know, the great work from a lot of, you know, this, it's been a huge year, great work from a lot of people, the, the folks from the Rosetta team, there's going to be the folks from the, from the New Horizons team, the astronauts, uh, Commander Hadfield, there's all kinds of people that you should really uh, be going there and, and nominating and see if we can get them, uh, them up big. I think three of the positions are already locked in, which is kind of stupid, it's like Neil deGrasse Tyson, Bill Nye, and ASAP Science, so there's like one slot open for everybody else, like Chris right. Hadfield, you know, so anyway, who I think has won all the internets forever. So, uh, anyway, so thanks everybody for watching. Thanks, uh, David and Ramin for joining us. Thanks again to Paul for for joining and giving us an update on his Kickstarter. I uh, I'm so excited that he got his uh, that they they met the funding goal. So, uh, go to Fight for Space and uh, and support that Kickstarter. All right, thanks everyone, and we'll see you all next week. Later.